How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. On this show, we explore genetics impact on our health through conversations with leaders in the field. These are experts like genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, authors, and patient advocates. My guest today is Danny Shapiro, who is the author of many books, including Inheritance, which we're going to be chatting about in this episode. Her writing has appeared in publications like The New Yorker, Vogue, and The New York Times. She's the podcast host of Family Secrets, and fun fact, she's also a Sarah Lawrence alumni. Stick around till the end of the episode to learn about our giveaway for a copy of Inheritance. Thank you so much, Danny Shapiro, for coming on the show. I'm really excited to talk about your book, Inheritance. For those that haven't read your book, can you share what the memoir is about? Sure. Um... So Inheritance is actually my 10th book um, and my fifth memoir, crazily enough. Um, About four years ago, I um, sort of recreationally uh, did a a home DNA test. Um, Really, it was my husband's idea, and I just kind of went along for the ride. And when my results came back, they were initially just really confusing. my, the breakdown of my ethnicity on Ancestry.com made no sense to me. And um, step by step, uh, over a very short period of time, really just a couple of days, I uh, came to the realization that the dad who raised me had not been my biological father. And that's not something that had ever consciously occurred to me in my entire life. And um, over the course of... Um, really only a few days, I was able to piece together the entire story of how that had come to be. Um, My my parents were both gone. Uh, They were both deceased. My father died when I was um, 23. So he had been gone a really long time and was an incredibly important figure in my life, still is. Um, But I was able to unearth or, you know, sort of discover, I had just enough clues to be able to trace back, um, based on kind of a couple of hunches and also, uh, a close relative, someone showing up as a first cousin on my ancestry.com page. Um, I was able to, um, find the person who uh, is my biological father, um, and to, um, to piece together the story of what had happened. And so when you first opened these results, I mean, you must have just been confused at first, but also just like shocked of what it could mean. I mean, what was that like, that experience and your first thoughts when you saw the results? Like, did your mind automatically go to maybe one of my parents isn't biological relative to mine? Or like, where did your mind start going? No, it really didn't. I mean, that is such a radical thought to have if it's not something that you've ever thought before that um, my first thought was Ancestry.com must have made a mistake. These companies must make mistakes. That can't be true. You know, my, um, you know, spit test must have gotten mixed up with somebody else's. And um, really, it was it, it was just when I look back on it now incredible denial and sort of innocence in a way but no it was it took a couple of steps to get to a place where i um was face to face with the truth of what those results meant and the way that i was able to do that um that listeners might be interested in is well i thought my parents are gone i can't ask them um i have a half sister from an early marriage of my father's who um, is 15 years older than I am. And we weren't in particularly close touch, but I had remembered that at the beginning of commercial DNA testing, she had done, she had gotten her, her, um, she had gone to 20, 23 and me and gotten her 
um, her DNA tested, um, mostly for health reasons. I think she was just, she's also really someone who's an early adopter of all this kind of anything, anything scientific. And um, I wrote to her and I said, do you have your results from your test that you did years ago? And there is a way, a very simple way, a site called GEDmatch, where two sets of results um, that are identified only by kit numbers, by actual like a stream of numbers, can be compared side by side to see how closely or not closely those two um, people are related. And when those results came back, uh, they showed that um, that she and I were not related. And that was when I I knew. And that is when I felt, you know, the kind of groundlessness of shock and, you know, just being completely stunned to make that discovery. Because it's not something that you had considered earlier in life. I mean, when you were using GEDmatch to look at you and your half-sister's DNA and comparing, you know, the sequences and the, and the results there, was it easy to see that that was the answer, that you weren't biologically related? Or was it hard to decipher, like, what does this mean? Are you related? Like, how easy was that to use and figure out? Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to do that um, easily on my own. Uh, my husband is a journalist and, you know, a bit of a science geek and, you know, just knows this stuff. And he understood what 4.5 generations to most recent common ancestor meant. You know, I mean, to the, the layperson, 4.5 generations to a most recent common ancestor wouldn't seem like that much when you actually just say that, oh, four and a half generations, well, we're still related. But four and a half generations within an ethnic group, I've come to understand and you know, um, I, my understanding was that both of my parents were Eastern European Ashkenazi and my half sisters, you know, my father was Eastern European Ashkenazi. Um, everyone at that point, um, with, um, you know, within a particular ethnicity is going to be four and a half or five generations from our most recent common ancestors. So it was, um, I was about as related to my half sister as to someone I passed by on the street. A total stranger, I but but it, but it would not. To your point, it would not have been easy for me. I, I mean, I would have figured it out. I would have looked it up. I would have educated myself. But my husband just looked at those numbers and said, "You are not sisters." Yeah, I think that's a really good point to say of people thinking like, "Oh, so you are related somewhere." But it's like, yes, if you pick any, not any ethnic group, but certain ethnic groups, you can see well, most people are related to some extent. I mean as humans, we're all related at some level. Um, so just kind of being able to decipher that information can be challenging. And then, you know, the more challenging part is just processing this. I mean, one of the, you know, quotes from your book that really stuck with me was, how old was too old to blow up the past rather than keep it intact? I mean, this wasn't just your secret, but, you know, your father's, your mother's, was it conflicting to start questioning paternity to family and friends to start having these conversations and figure out, you know, what that process was? I think it would have been more of a conflict for me if my father had still been living because it became clear to me very quickly, you know, my, my, my parents had had trouble conceiving. Um, it was a time in the early 1960s when infertility particularly male infertility, was a really shameful thing. You did not talk about it. It was so shameful that doctors wouldn't even diagnose it. You know, there was no such thing as male infertility. It was always, it was always the woman's issue. Um, and my parents went to an institute in Philadelphia that um, used, uh, employed sperm donors and one of the things that I discovered in the extensive research that I did, you know, over the year and a half or two years um, in which I was writing Inheritance, is that a couple would have been told, go home and never tell anyone this ever happened. Never, don't tell your own parents, don't tell your siblings, don't tell your friends. The child will never know, and that's for the best. And so, I think that if my father in particular had been living, given that it was clearly a secret, 
that he, both he and my mother intended to take to the grave with them and did take to the grave. You know, they couldn't have imagined that there would be a day, you know, a point in, in history, um, possibly even within their own lifetimes, although, although they didn't survive long enough to really see where, um, you could spit into a plastic vial and send it off in an envelope. And then, you know, there would be this thing called the internet where, you know, just about everything is discoverable and, 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 you know, you can find things out. Um, they, they couldn't have imagined such a future. Um, but other than my parents, and again, my father in particular, um, I had no misgivings about digging in and researching and trying to discover everything that I could because like a really important distinction I want to make is, you know, if, if, if someone is, I mean, we, we are formed by the stories that we're told from the time that we are very, very young. Our identities are formed by the stories that we're told. And so say if someone is an adoptee and the story that they've been told from the time that they are old enough to hear stories is you were adopted. We love you very much. Um, this is the story of how you came to us, your adoptive parents, then that child grows up knowing that story. And I'm not saying that that is not complicated and difficult. And I know a lot of adoptees have feelings of, um, in the adoption world, it's called genealogical bewilderment, you know, where, where of a desire to know, you know, where they come from and from whom they, from whom they come, but they always knew so assuming that they were told, there also are stories that are still tumbling out of like late discovery adoptees who never knew. Um, but that that feeling of believing a narrative, I was told a narrative all my life that was a lie. It was a secret. And so making that discovery in midlife and having to kind of in a way undo and rethink everything that I had known about my own history was really traumatic and complicated and, and, and shocking. And also, you know, I said before, I'm, you know, the author of 10 books as a writer, I had always written about secrets. I, Oh, whether it was my novels or my other memoirs, it was like, I knew there was a secret and I was just digging and digging. I just wasn't digging deeply enough or didn't even know what I was digging for. And so to make that discovery and also to be a writer where that's literally what I do, I excavate, you know, that's, I, I try to put stories together that make sense. I, I just was utterly compelled to do that. And you document it so beautifully in the book of, you know, I feel like we're right there with you as you're discovering the next part and figuring it out and working with your husband and, you know, trying to figure out like, what does all of this mean is, you know, you're getting to that answer. And I mean, then at one point, you know, you write that it was 36 hours from the point of finding out, you know, your father wasn't your biological father to then having someone that was a potential match. And I was just like 36 hours, like, you know, that's just wild. What short amount of time you're thinking and taking all of this in during that time, did you ever question if you wanted to move forward and learn more? I mean, that's a lot to be, you know, uncovering in such a short amount of time. It did feel like the velocity of it was really um, staggering. But no, I never had a moment of thinking I don't want to know. Because again, if if you believe yourself to be, you know, if you think you know where you come from and you discover that you didn't, that you spent your life kind of laboring under um, sort of the most massive kind of misconception and even things like, I mean, medical history, it was, it was with a shock that I realized, oh my God, I have been giving incorrect medical history all my life. When you go to a doctor's office and they take your mother's history and your father's history, I was giving a history that was not mine genetically. And that is dangerous. I was also 
giving a history for my own child when I became a mother that was incorrect and that is dangerous. And and so there was, you know, a feeling of I want to know. I just I wanted to know. I was a little frightened. Um, I had no idea what I was going to discover or who I was going to discover or whether that discovery would result in a door slammed in my face or someone de- or did not or or more than a door slammed you know in my face just never being able to know many many people who find themselves in the situation that I did are not able ever to put the pieces together and I was able because of just a couple of clues and an educated guess and the fact that my husband and I both do research and reporting for a living, I was able to arrive at my biological father in 36 hours. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable when I hear other people's stories. Um, I've never heard of it being quite that fast of a turnaround time in terms of finding that potential match. And then, you know, it's like, wow, that actually is the case. And I mean, you brought up a fantastic point from a health perspective of the family history you had been given was not correct. And like, that's, you know, can be really misleading of thinking you're not at high risk for certain conditions and saying, oh, my family history is this or thinking you're at high risk when you're not, um, for you and your son, you know, really important information. And then being able to, you know, get that real information for your paternal side um, so that you could update those records and see if there was anything else to be mindful of. And um, I mean, if we kind of go back to when you did find the potential match, I mean, what, how did you connect with your biological father at that point? I mean, how did you sit down and say, okay, what am I emailing him? What am I writing in this letter? I think I had the instinct. Um, I mean, I knew, I knew I was right that this was that this was the person who was my biological father. Um, his nephew matched as a first cousin um, on Ancestry.com, and I knew that my parents had gone to an institute that was on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania, and the educated guess part is that my husband and I both thought the donor was probably a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania. And, you know, using nothing more than Facebook and an obituary um, of um, this first cousin on Facebook's mother, she was survived by a brother, therefore an uncle, if you're following me, um, of my first cousin, Um, who graduated from University of Pennsylvania Medical School um, in the years during which I was conceived. And then there was the fact that when I looked him up, which was easy to do, again, you know, some people are a little less visible on the internet than others, but he was pretty visible. Um, And he he lectures, he's a retired doctor. And I was looking at the familiar. I was looking at my own gestures. I was I was looking at something I had never seen before without knowing that I had never seen it. Um, so it was completely clear to me, even though totally surreal, but it was clear to me that I was looking at my biological father. And, and then my instinct was, this is going to be a shock for him. And in all likelihood, and what would it be like to be a 78 year old retired physician and opening your email one morning and like amid the political entreaties and, you know, golf club dues and, you know, whatever, have there be this bombshell. And so I was very careful. I tried to put myself in his shoes which is something that I do as as a writer. It's something that I've always done is try to really imagine the other, try to really imagine imagine the what it might feel like to be this other person. And so I wrote him a really careful email. I uh, told him uh, what I had discovered. Um, I made it clear that I didn't want anything from him, which and that I would respect his privacy which is something, you know, when Inheritance came out, I was on book tour. It came out 
in 20 in January of 2019, I was on book tour pretty much right up until the pandemic, um, speaking to many, many thousands of people all over the country. And I heard this story over and over again, that when, you know, so many of these discoveries are being made because of DNA testing, right? It's not just misattributed parenthood. It's, it can be you know, adoptees finding their birth parents. It can be people finding half siblings they didn't know they had, or men finding, you know, being found by children that they never even knew about in any way. And the first feeling that everyone who's contacted seems to have is feeling threatened. You know, what do you want? What do you want from me? You know, I don't have anything to give you. And, and it's it's human nature. And I think I just kind of intuited that, that it's human nature. If somebody's like, you think, you know, um, you're 78 years old. You think, you know, how many children you have, you think, you know, what the shape of your life is. Uh, in his case, he had been married for over 50 years and his wife never knew that he had been a sperm donor as a medical student. He, not because he was keeping it a secret. He just didn't really think about it after he did it. And so I was aware of what a, what a shock it might be for him. And that's, how I composed that initial email to him. I didn't want him, I didn't want to scare him. And for those that are interested, the actual letter um, is in the book too. So to be able to actually read what you sent to him and, and see the emails back and forth is just really interesting to see how your relationship started and feeling each other out and, and seeing how this was going to work and the back and forth there. I mean, during those exchanges, were you also thinking, maybe I have other half biological siblings out there? And like, you know, what's the chance that I'm the only offspring from him donating sperm? Yeah, I think that that's what he was most worried about. I think, you know, it's one thing for one biological child to come knocking on your door if you were a sperm donor many years before um, maybe that could even be a nice thing. But what if there are 37 biological, you know, offspring knocking on your door? This happens, and it happens all the time. And I and that could really upend a life and be um, super complicated. And 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 that is in fact more common than not. I I have I just you know just parenthetically here, I have not discovered. No, I haven't looked, but no other biological half siblings have turned up or contacted me. And that makes me pretty unusual in this situation. It's much more common for people to make this discovery and discover that they do have a dozen or two dozen or more or many more half siblings, which is its own kind of destabilizing thing. But I wasn't thinking about it that much in the moment other than um the ethics of that and how and how he would feel about it because i think that that was what he was nervous about yeah certainly i mean when he hadn't been thinking about this for many 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 years of you know as you said he kind of wasn't thinking that donating sperm back then became anything um, for those that, you know, recently over the holidays were gifted one of these direct consumer tests like 23andMe, like Ancestry, what advice do you have for them in terms of, you know, as they're thinking about whether they want to do it or not, um, you know, of going through the journey that you have, do you have any particular, you know, tips for them or insight as to what they should think about and consider before they're spitting into their kits? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think my 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 book has woken up a lot of people, at, as have other stories that have come out and you know been in the media about the possibility that um, there may be a bigger surprise than uh, you know Kelly Ripa discovering that she was an eighth Italian, or you know the guy with the lederhosen on the you know on the ancestry dot com ad. There may yeah. be. A there may be a bigger surprise than, you know, the fun facts um, that most people are um, are taking these tests to discover or, you know, to kind of fill in their family tree. Um, 
I think the statistic is that it's somewhere around 7% of people who do these tests discover some kind of um, non-parental event or, you know, not parent expected. That's a lot, a lot of people when you think of the many millions of people who take these tests. So, you know, look, I, I am an object lesson in this. I'm someone who took the test and completely forgot about it. That's how unimportant it was to me. I, I wasn't waiting for my results to come back. I was to I totally could not have been more casual. And it, um, was a life altering discovery for me. I will say, and I guess in terms of, you know, people often ask me, you know, are you sorry you found out? I am so grateful that I found out because I do think that anyone who makes a discovery like this, where there has been something that's really been kept from them all their lives, has a feeling beneath the shock of on some level, oh, that makes sense. And that really happened for me. And, you know, I, I had spent my life feeling somehow like I didn't quite fit in, like I didn't quite fit into my family, like there was something different about me that I was other. Um, I was often told that I didn't look quote unquote Jewish, that I didn't look like the rest of my family, because I didn't. And that was always confusing to me and always made me feel a little bit, I mean, such a politically incorrect thing to say to anybody, but people do say things like that, and they certainly did. Um, and, and so it was enormously liberating to actually discover the truth of myself. I'm very glad I know, and I think that people who make these discoveries, even when they are agonizing initially also feel grateful to know because it solves a mystery that on some level we walk around with because secrets don't just disappear they they sleep in corners you know they 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 lurk in shadows um but they're always there and they shape us so um i just think people who do these tests need to know that that is a possibility. And I wish that the direct-to-consumer testing companies were willing to be more transparent about that and include it in their marketing and advertising in some way, uh, not just hire people to be counselors when people call, as, you know, as we did, saying, wait, there's been a mistake. This can't be right. I mean, they do have people, you know, they have they have people handling phone calls like that, but they'd like to stay on the side of, isn't this just good fun? Yeah, I think that's a, a good point to make and something that I do hope that, you know, when you open up that kit and you're about to spit into it, there's a warning label, label or something like that that says, you know, just so you know, you could find out things like endless things like non-parent expe uh, expected events and um, go through like you could find out you have other biological relatives you didn't know about different countries you're from and just so many different aspects that can come out of this that are surprises so you know I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing your journey with us and being able to you know peer inside the book um, really appreciate you coming on it's just fantastic to have you on and another Connecticut person <laughs> so um, it's really really been great thank you so much I really enjoyed it thank you to win your own copy of Inheritance, head over to our Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, all the social media, and you can enter into the book giveaway. Just search DNA Today on those platforms. And part of the instructions is going to be to follow Danny Shapiro on Instagram, which is at Danny Writer. Go check out her podcast too. It's called Family Secrets. This is a collection of stories from guests who have also discovered long hidden secrets from their family's past. And it's also being adapted into a show. So definitely a cool one to check out right now. If you found the topics of this episode interesting, you're going to love our two series from 2020. This 
explored infertility and direct consumer genetic testing. So you can check out those episodes. It was seven episodes each for those series. So a lot of topics and information to explore in there. Another recommendation is to head over to festivalofgenomics.com. This is the UK's largest genomics event. It is taking place in just a couple weeks on January 26th and wrapping up on the 29th. You're going to see a lot of familiar names on there, people that have been guests on the show, people we've mentioned before on the show. It is a really long list of impressive presenters. So head over to festivalofgenomics.com to learn more. And for 90% of people, it's actually free to register and attend. So obviously online festivalofgenomics.com. For all information on this show, including all the links we've mentioned, head over to dnapodcast.com. That way you don't have to remember everything we talk about. So all the information for this episode and all of our previous episodes, dnapodcast.com. And any questions, comments, concerns, brain blasts you have from this episode, email in info at dnapodcast.com. We'd love to connect with you and hear from you listeners. Last favorite ask, please rate and review us on Apple or wherever you listen to this podcast. A lot of podcast players accept submissions for rating and review so that you can let others know how much you enjoy the show and then other people can find us as well. So please do that. And, you know, we'd love to give you a shout out on the show too, if you do that and you can email us with that. Thanks for listening and join us next time to learn, discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA, we're all made of the same chemical DNA.